through the shared use, through the park on the shared use path um, to appreciate the water um, and to really make that great connection to downtown. Um, you'll see that um, as, as we've always had, um, we're making great connections back to Merrimack Street by way of Ferry Wharf Way and Central Wharf Way. Um, so continuing that, um, that ways to the water um, that ha has been so important in Newburyport's history um, and the balance of parking between an east lot and a west lot, which will still provide that um, important amenity to downtown, but um, really giving over more land to the park, um, which is a really important amenity at the heart of downtown. Um, finally, the development of the visitor center and restroom um, right on the on the corner of Merrimack Street and Summersby Way, um, and we'll be sharing a lot more uh, in input on that tonight. Um, so on the next slide, you can see that what we're going to do today, this, this plan is very familiar to you all, um, but what we're going to do tonight really briefly is um, give you some key updates to areas that we've continued to add detail to based on the feedback we've heard from you thus far. Um, and also just ongoing um, development of detail of the park. Um, and so we're looking forward to having a good conversation with you all about um, whether we've heard you correctly um, and, and whether these details are landing uh, for the city of Newburyport. So just taking a sort of a deeper dive into each of these spaces, the Harbor Master area, um, you can go ahead, Maren, to the next one. The Harbor Master area um, is one that we've heard a lot from you all um, and from certain members of the um, commercial fishing industry um, and the harbor master about. Um, and so we've come back to you with a revised plan of this area, which has been documented at 75%. Um, we heard a lot about the need to separate the vehicular pavement um, and the service route to the harbor master, which is a important uh, support um, area for the commercial fishing industry from the day-to-day -day enjoyment of the park. So previously we had a plaza that was doubling as enjoyment and vehicular service. And what we've done is separate that out. Um, so trucks will have a turnaround um, to enable them to back into the Harbor Master area or back out of the Harbor Master area. That turnaround will be well screened with vegetation um, and planting to allow it to function as a really important service area for the Harbor Master area, but not to, um, not to impede too much on the enjoyment of the park. Uh, so within that planted area now is where day-to-day um, -day enjoyment of the park could still happen in this part of the park. Um, we're proposing an informal picnic area and hammocks that would allow people again to get up under the trees, look out at the water, be in this corner of the park um, in a really um, wonderful way, but not be interfering with the activities of the Harbor Master. Um, there's still a flat area for dock storage, um, as, as we've noted before. Um, so this area has developed a little bit, and we're pretty excited to bring those plans back to you. On the next slide, you'll see um, that the swing trellis area, so this is an area we've, we've called Ferry Wharf Plaza, because it really is at the junction of the shared use path uh, and Ferry Wharf Way, which will be a really important part of the park activity. Uh, so we've, we've been developing this area and um, have a lot more details in our 75% drawings about um, how wonderful those social steps will be as a way to sort of sit on the edge and watch the activity of the shared use path um, and the water beyond that, um, and how wonderful it'll be to sit in the swing benches, um, which sit behind that and are, are a shady way, um, a kind of front porch on the Merrimack, a place to gather with friends um, to look over that view and to have that pause, um, whether you're on the shared use path or coming down from town uh, on Ferry Wharf Way. The Indigenous Peoples Plaza is a, is a feature that was added um, sort of late in the spring. Um, we heard through Director Port um, that there's a group that's very interested in honoring the contributions of Indigenous peoples in the history of Newburyport. Uh, the Indigenous Peoples Plaza uh, takes the form of a circle, which is a really important shape in Indigenous culture, um, would be made of flagstones with a stone wall, um, and really have a, have a sculptural element which evokes a traditional fire pit at the center of it. What we've done here is incorporate that into one of the mounded grassy areas behind the berm, between the berm and the shared use path. Uh, so the goal here is that it is a wonderful place to be, a sort of reflective, slightly more quiet space to be with a great view on a daily basis, but it's also a nice ceremonial space for those times when the indigenous community of Newburyport wants to gather uh, and have a ceremony. So you'll hear more about that um, as, as the details develop. On the next slide, um, the, the final one, I think, in terms of the park development, uh, we've done quite a bit of work with the city to ensure that 
The existing commercial activities along Merrimack Street have a robust support system for service and deliveries um, through the park um, as they do today. Uh, so here you can see that the area where the dumpster enclosure is, which currently provides uh, the enclosure for trash for the firehouse restaurant, um, will be um, added to a little bit to ensure that there's great vehicular access to that. Um, there's a new pathway that would come, that would extend the pathway that exists today, make it ADA accessible and allow that access, that day-to-day -day access for the restaurant to drop their trash and then for the dumpster truck to come in um, and unload trash. Um, there's also um, an off-street space and out of kind of out of the way of parking space uh, for deliveries for the uh, commercial activities along Merrimack Street. Um, so we've added quite a bit of detail to this area um, and have worked it through um, extensively with the commercial community along Merrimack Street um, and think we have a good solution that minimizes impact on day-to-day -day park use. You can see the way comes through there um, and still has um, great access um, even when a delivery vehicle is, is parked um, and needing to service those businesses. So next up, I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to talk a little bit more about the visitor center and the visitor center site and how this has developed, um, especially related to the feedback we've heard from you all and uh, the work that we've done together with the city of Newburyport on ensuring that the building meets all of the resilience standards that the city has. Dan? Yes. Hi. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, so this this is where we were at schematic design um, last fall. Uh, the, the plan of the building was separated by a men's and women's. It had six uh, toilet fixtures on each side. There was also a small family-sized family, size, family uh, restroom and a small visitor center of about 100 square feet. Uh, that was that overall building footprint was about 1,400, 1,450 square feet. Um, and we were intending it to be brick clad uh, exterior and the estimated cost, which we didn't have a cost estimate for it, but it, we estimated it to be about 1.2 million in uh, uh, last year's dollars. And the location of it, and you're all familiar with the discussions that we had locating it by Central Wharf Way, whether it was parallel or perpendicular. Um, and at one point we settled on having it uh, perpendicular to Merrimack Street, um, next slide. And then as discussions went on, uh, we simplified the building a bit. Uh, we went away from having a vestibule space with uh, two separate men's and women's restrooms. Uh, and we were putting in uh, eight total um, restrooms. There's a mechanical space in the middle of the building and then the visitor center on the front or on the south side facing Merrimack Street. Um, the total gross square footage is close to just over 900 square feet. Um, we also, uh, in our discussions, we switched from brick to wood clad, uh, wood clabbered siding. Uh, this and this building is, again, as you know, is that we're aiming for net zero energy building. Uh, the current cost estimate for uh, anticipated start of spring 2024 right now is 1.3 million. Next slide. And currently the way it's sited right now is uh, at, well, at one point we, there was a desire to move the building all the way to the uh, left side of the, the, uh, this site uh, adjacent to Summersby Way. Um, but in, uh, in our sort of our discussions on resiliency and setting the building elevation at 15.33, which is uh, 40 inches above the base flood elevation of 12, uh, which you'll see in a slide a little bit later. Um, but in the, the process of grading up to that 15.33 elevation, we it, it sort of the building needed to meander a little bit back towards the east uh, to get that ramp and the steps in from the, the plaza on the corner and from the parking lot. Uh, so the site uh, is accessible on all sides. You can access it from the parking lot or Central Wharf Way or uh, along Merrimack Street. And there's two site sections cut in the next image uh, showing that sort of the, the height difference. So Summersby Way is about 
two feet lower than the plaza, uh, which is roughly at the same level as Central Wharf Way. Uh, the parking lot is about three and a half feet below um, uh, the plaza level, 15.33. Uh, and Merrimack Street is you know, about a foot and a half to two feet below. It's, it's, it, it gently slopes up towards Central Wharf Way. Uh, so there's a slight height, you know, a slight elevation change from the sidewalk up to the plaza, which you can see in some renderings that are coming up in a moment. Uh, so this is a view looking towards the west, uh, the visitor center in the plaza. Uh, Central Wharf Way is sort of in the, the center foreground. Um, uh, next slide. And here's the view from the corner uh, with a sort of a two foot grade change. There's steps, you know, gently, gently rising steps from the corner. And you can see the ramp off to the left that gets you up to that plaza to make it accessible. Uh, the building, as I said earlier, the building is wood clabbered siding. Uh, right now we're considering it as a, um, uh, it's, it's cedar, white cedar or red cedar, which, as a natural color when it's first installed, but can gray out, uh, similar to what you see in the Cape or in Nantucket. Um, there's wood frame windows. Uh, there's a canopy of about uh, eight and a half feet that extends out across the south face of the building to help shade the, the storefront windows. They look a little dark there, but it's, it's really, it's clear glass. Uh, it just happens to be in shade at the moment. Um, next slide. Uh, and then this, this explains the, um, uh, the FEMA flood zone, which is that dark blue line uh, just touching the corner of the building. Um, and again, we've had to set this elevation at 15.33, which is 40 inches above elevation 12. Um, and as I said earlier, the original location was on the east side of the site. We moved it as far west as we could to, to sort of maximize views to the water from Merrimack Street. Uh, but in grading this project, the site grading uh, sort of forced the building to sort of nudge its way a little bit back towards the east. Next slide. Uh, then just one other consideration on resiliency. Uh, in the 75% set, we, um, uh, we assumed we would have a slab on, concrete slab on grade floor, um, but there was a desire to make this building, to design this building so that it could be potentially lifted in the future if flood, you know, if sea level rise was causing some concern that we needed to lift this. Uh, so we switched to a wood frame floor with a little crawl space underneath. Um, and in keeping with the net zero building, we're providing insulation uh, beneath it. The, there's a very shallow slab uh, to protect the vapor barrier and the insulation uh, underneath the crawl space, but to keep that space a little bit warm so that um, uh, we're, uh, saving energy, not losing heat. Uh, and this, the, um, uh, the geotech report and the structural engineer recommend, uh, you know, economical frost wall uh, with footings uh, around the perimeter of the building uh, is the best way to do this. So that's what we're showing. Going to this, this wood floor option that it allows us to lift the building adds about $24,000 to the project uh, from our cost estimator. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, my name is Marin Braco, um, and I'll be going through the phasing and budget. And so we wanted to start with just a reminder of where we were in schematic design and how the project was separated out. Um, at that time, we didn't have the phases, the three phases identified that we do now. So just as a, as a reminder, we had sort of separated out based on sort of landscape character. Um, at this point, we now know that we'd like to build it in phases. And so that phase one will show more detailed diagrams as we mo move through, but <clears throat> for context, phase one, it's really now encompasses this landscape across the waterfront, so that east and west wing, as well as that those ways that connect 
the open space to the city. Phase two is made up of these east and west parking lots. And then phase three is the visitor center in that landscape. And so you'll see we've had to make some adjustments to um, our cost comparisons just to sort of make these numbers help you to understand sort of apples to apples where uh, the differences are coming up. And so this is an overview of uh, what we've now priced um, in our cost estimate after the 75% set. And so, as I said, phase one is the waterfront and the ways. Um, as we were working through construction documentation, there were uh, added uh, scope in these areas sort of along the ways uh, that you'll see added quite a significant area of um, landscape improvements. Phase two, as I mentioned, are the parking lots and then phase three being that building and, and uh, plaza surrounding it. There are some improvements being made to the waterfront trust property, which we've costed separately. And so after going through a first round of estimates, we realized that um, in order to stay within budget, we need to reduce phase one uh, slightly um, by reducing that, that sort of that footprint. And so we've taken out this area um, where that dumpster enclosure is, there is um, some improvements being made to this lawn here and moving that to phase two, as well as these planters um, along this edge that can be constructed with the parking lots very easily. And then the same thing on this side, we're taking that curb and paving a connection to the parking lot and recommending that that be moved to phase two. And then we have a series of diagrams that just illustrate the proposed <clears throat> plan with the an overlay of the existing area so you can start to understand what it would look like in the interim. And I will say for 75%, uh, we documented one full park design. We haven't accounted for phasing yet. And there's still some important discussions to be had about those interim conditions and how we resolve those. And um, that will uh, be reflected in the 100% set. So this is phase one uh, with uh, the open space along the waterfront and those ways and some minimal uh, landscape improvements on either side to meet existing grade. And this is phase one and two constructed together. So now you have the parking lots, the dumpster enclosure and the expanded uh, landscape improvements along the ways. And then phase three with the visitor center complete. And so there's going to be a few charts here that have a lot of information and I'll do my best to highlight the important numbers and I'm happy to answer questions as we're going through these. But um, I think, let's see, I think we're going to focus tonight primarily on phase one and uh, the estimates coming through. I think it should come as no surprise as Andy alluded to in the beginning, we're seeing across the country on all of our projects, a lot of increases due to market fluctuation. And so we sort of knew that the, the estimate would come in a bit higher and we're sort of prepared for that. So these numbers, as I mentioned, um, because SD was broken out separately, uh, in order to sort of compare SD to CD, um, you have to look at phase one and two together uh, as the waterfront open space, the ways and the parking lots. Um, during SD that was coming in at around 5 million. And we're now seeing with escalation and contingencies um, and all of those markups, uh, it's at around 8 million. And then for the visitor center, that phase three, um, as Dan mentioned, the building is coming in roughly about what we had estimated uh, in SD. There is a significant increase in the landscape based on the accessibility and resiliency uh, requirements that we needed to meet, as well as just having a much more um, sort of expanded plaza in that area and expanded design. And so in this uh, comparison we have, we were coming in at 1.6 million for SD and we're now looking at 2.3 million. Uh, we're going to sort of 
go through phase one first in a bit more detail and explain where specifically we saw those increases and our recommendations for how we get to that um, phase one budget that we know um, the city has been targeting. And then we can go through some of the other uh, <clears throat> items in more detail. And so I'll just go through some of the big ticket items that where we saw a big uh, jump in price. Uh, the first being site preparation and demolition. Um, in SD, we had held $25,000 for mobilization. I think with a more detailed design and then also factoring in phasing, which means mobilization has to happen three times instead of just once, uh, we saw uh, more than $200,000 increase there. Um, there is an additional $156,000 in earthwork, and some of that was due to a more detailed understanding of landfill disposal. Uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, there, this is, site is an AUL, and we're trying to reuse and cap as much of the soil as we can, uh, but there are varying depths that we can um, do that with. And uh, per the geotech report, uh, we're learning that some of the foundations to some of the site structures require ground improvements that uh, just require more excavation than we had been aware of in SD. In terms of utilities and infrastructure, <clears throat> the big increases came through irrigation on site electric. In SD, we had really just held allowances. We didn't have those specific subconsultants or specific design uh, during that phase. Uh, at this point, during construction documentation, those consultants have been working very closely with us and with the city directly in the Waterfront Trust to <clears throat> create a design that works not only for the park, but for um, the surrounding projects and improvements that are happening. And so we're seeing uh, both just an expanded area for both of those areas and then um, increase in some of the the prices on um, some of the specific elements. Um, <clears throat> um, for hardscape and surface finishes, um, in general, given the market, we're seeing like somewhere from 30 to 50% increase in the unit prices. And so this price, this number has come up quite a bit. Um, we have not, except in phase three, we haven't expanded any of those uh, pavement areas. It's really just the, the cost per square foot. Uh, for site furnishings, the big increase there, again, we're seeing increases due to market fluctuation, um, but the swing trellis is now much more thoroughly designed and engineered. And so we did see that that price went up. Um, we also, this is one that requires ground improvements based on the geotechnical report. And so that um, also increased the price. And so this is uh, starting to visualize where we can find cost savings to get us back down to that number for phase one. Um, and so we've looked at both reducing the scope of phase one, like that overall footprint, and also trying to identify items that can be um, donor funded potentially. And everything that, go ahead. Maren, I'm sorry, if I could just jump in there. Um, just wanna make sure that folks, as you're looking at this information, just consider that um, one of the options that we have and, and Sasaki and I have talked about is um, something that we, when we do bidding, we sometimes have something we call add alts, which is basically a list of uh, options that the city may choose to do in addition to the base bid. So uh, the idea here, like Marin is walking us through here for the base portion of the project and that uh, first phase might be uh, slightly reduced in its original area. Um, in addition to that, we can, during the bidding process, because we don't know what the market will hold in the coming months um, or years, um, and, um, and because of that, we also want to take advantage of as much or as far as our dollars will reach. So what we might be doing is bidding uh, the base bid, but also adding in some of these elements here in the bid sequence uh, so that we could try to take advantage of as much uh, funding as is possible um, for as much ground as possible. Uh, recognizing that the, the cost could also go down at some point in the you know the future because of uh, fluctuations in the economy. So we don't want to miss the opportunity, but we are, of course, shaving back to make sure that we're uh, staying within budget, like Marin said. So just keep in mind that there are some possibilities for, uh, in addition to donations, to um, potentially with better bid prices, um, pulling back in some of these elements that might be um, need to be hold, held off on initially. Thank you for that clarification, Andy. 
Um, so I'll start with the items in this purple color, which are the <clears throat> reductions where we're recommending to move to phase two. And then the orange are the items that we see as potential uh, donor items that we're hoping, as Andy said, we can include as ad alternates and still include in phase one. Um, but for budgeting purposes right now, assume that they have a separate funding source. And so the black hatched area is this reduced <clears throat> scope. Um, so again, these areas on either side of the parking lot or those curbs and planting edges, this covers the uh, dumpster enclosure. And here we were recommending reinforced turf so that uh, vehicles during events could drive onto the lawn and have a space um, for drop off or potentially food trucks. And that we're recommending all happens uh, with phase two construction. Um, <clears throat> The restroom trailer, uh, we've been in communication with the city about whether or not that should be demolished or relocated. Uh, originally, we had priced it to be relocated on site so that it could remain functional during uh, phase one and phase two. But we've decided uh, to demolish it and to bring in porta potties. Um, so that had a pretty significant cost savings there. Um, there's a couple of utilities that um, we had originally scoped as all happening in phase one um, to at least sort of <clears throat> do the, the excavation and earthwork needed for those. But there are a couple of items that we think make a lot of sense to happen in phase two. Uh, one of those being that under drainage for the event lawn that I mentioned, as we're not constructing that, that can easily be constructed at the same time in phase two. Uh, there's also an area, uh, drainage, area for the new uh, <clears throat> parking lot that can be constructed at the same time. Um, I think the only other item here is that we had originally designed this uh, swing trellis. They're sort of separate structures. Each structure holds one swing. Um, we had originally had it at 16, but we've done some design study and feel pretty comfortable with the idea of reducing that to 12 and still having enough um, space and activation in that plaza. Um, and then the second element, I think I'll move on to these orange items as donor items. Um, all of the swings attached to those structures were moving into that donor list. Um, I think in our conversations with the city, they feel pretty confident that that's something we can easily um, get funding for. Uh, we've done the same for benches on the site. Um, and so that had a pretty significant cost savings. Uh, the furnishings that we've recommended for the Harbor Master uh, sort of area near this picnic and hammock grove, uh, we plant this fully and landscape it and grade it, but allow those furnishings to be added as the funding becomes available. Um, the last two items are the Indigenous Peoples Plaza, um, we can make sure that we have all of the grading uh, sort of ready for this to go in, but that the paving and the stone walls and the sculpture could be uh, added later. And I think the city has mentioned working with an artist on some of the details of this and some of the interpretive signage. So um, that has not yet begun. And so I think that's a, a good one to sort of make sure that we have uh, the, the time to be thoughtful about exactly how that ex gets expressed. Um, and similarly, we have a sculpture at the West Embayment Plaza that uh, we've currently just been holding as an allowance. And so that item as well, we think um, makes sense to move to that donor list. And so with all of that, we've come down um, by over a million dollars, so 1.2, um, and that's before markup. So before contingency and escalation. And so this is just an image of uh, those potential donor items. Um, so as I, as I was mentioning with the swing structure, I think the thing to point out here is we'd be constructing all the foundations and all putting all of the structures in place uh, for phase one, but just looking for donors for the, the swings themselves. And so there's two different types here. We have the sort of bench style um, that's really uh, comfortable and 
you know, uh, meets needs for sort of all abilities and then a lounge swing if someone wants to lay down. These ones are a little bit more expensive, it's a bit bigger. And so here's sort of that a summary slide again, a lot of numbers here, but um, I think the important things to look at here again is we had originally been at close to 5 million for that phase one. And after the 1.2 million reduction, we're at 3.5. Um, and then once you add in these markups where we had been 1.6 over, we're now actually under by about 25,000. Um, sort of going through all of this. And I'll say right now, the cost estimate as we have it is using these larger numbers, but once we have consensus on um, value engineering and strategies, we'll revise that estimate to reflect these costs to give you a more detailed breakdown. And I'm happy to stop there if there are any questions that I know that was a lot and that was all just on phase one, which I understand as a priority. The next few slides just talk through the changes that we've uh, documented in phase three and then the scope of work that's outside of the city property. I can't tell, I'll keep going unless someone has a question. Yeah, yeah Shane, we'll defer to you on how you wanna handle questions or uh, when you wanna well, do more. Counselors, do you all have any questions you want to ask at this time or do you want to finish up the presentation? I know we've seen a lot. Uh, I'll let somebody finish. Okay. Yeah, do, you see great. Up? do you want to ask a question or do you want to let something go? Uh, that's fine. I can wait until the end too. Okay. Thank you. Keep on going, Erin. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And so this is just a comparison of that phase three architecture, visitor center, and the surrounding plaza, just to get a sense of uh, where we saw the increases in price. And so as Dan had mentioned earlier in the presentation, the restroom and visitor center had been located adjacent to the way and there was quite a bit of efficiency in terms of like paving and building entries because uh, we were really using the way in order to get into the building and as it had been originally designed there was i believe one maybe two entries so maybe one to the visitor center one to the restroom um, and now as you are aware there's one to the visitor center and then there are entries on either side of these longer walls. So there's just a lot more pavement needed just to get into the building and then be able to circulate around. Uh, the other thing I'll mention, obviously, with the building moving farther away and not, I think the original intent was to have it right adjacent to Summersby Way. But because we can't be adjacent to that plaza and we are not no longer adjacent to the way, there's it really expanded the paving. Um, I think creates a very nice space and there are a lot of benefits to this design that we're very excited about, but it does increase the cost. You can see quite a bit and just sort of visually how much more um, paving area we have more over the lawn. Um, we also see a lot of increases in the earthwork site prep and demo. Um, and that's due to the fact that we're raising the grade quite significantly. So when it was over here, this corner of the plaza is at, is at about 15. And so the amount that we would need to raise to meet that resiliency elevation of 15.33 was very minimal. Uh, but now that we've <clears throat> made this entire space at that elevation, there's like almost three feet of fill across most of this area. Um, that also requires the addition of steps, ramps, retaining walls, handrails, all of those things that had not been accounted for uh, in the original design. And then just as we developed more details and realized we had this uh, larger plaza space, we've added uh, bike racks, lighting, uh, cafe tables, a water fountain, um, drinking fountain uh, <clears throat> to, to sort of activate this space. And so that's really what's driving the cost here. And then this final slide just summarizes uh, the work sort of outside of the city property. And so Sasaki has been working separately on uh, drainage, drainage improvements recommendations. And that's really to improve, improve the stormwater infrastructure from market 
uh, square to the river and that uh, drain line runs through the park. And so while it's a separate funding source, it needed to be thought of um, in conjunction with the park improvements. And so that is coming in around 700, oh, sorry, 650K. And then within the waterfront trust area, uh, we have some utilities that need to cross their property um, and also support some of the other projects going on. So uh, for irrigation, in order to have one centralized system that supports the landscape on the east and west side, it needs to cross the central area owned by the Waterfront Trust. The Waterfront Trust and the city have also been working with our irrigation consultant to um, combine their systems. And so some of the irrigation will be uh, serving the Waterfront Trust plant beds around in and around the park. We're also seeing um, some of these numbers come from Site Electrical and that is in support of the Bulkhead project and some of the improvements needed uh, to be made along the boardwalk. Um, Marin, could I just jump in there as well? Mm -hmm. so, sorry, just uh, a couple of things for folks that might be worthwhile to note. Um, the electrical, uh, you know, as, as more work was done by the consultants or Sasaki and their subconsultants, it was apparent that some of the electrical equipment, uh, obviously the, the transformers and whatnot and, and other equipment um, required much more um, heavy work in terms of relocation, uh, you know, reinstallation than uh, based on its present uh, location of the, that hardware as well as the lines that are running through the site. Um, so it was apparent that a little more work was required to do that. We also recognized that um, because of the bulkhead project and the electrical coming from the land side, um, those same facilities that we would need to um, make some adjustments uh, because the electrical there is being adjusted, um, the height of that, for instance, being adjusted on the bulkhead wall and everything has to be reconnected a bit. Um, the um, one other thing here is in the uh, the waterfront trust area, there was some discussion about uh, for the park itself having a, uh, a cohesive irrigation system for the whole lawn areas, for instance, for the, uh, the landscaped areas, uh, rather than having these sort of arbitrarily designed irrigation systems following uh, these, these, you know, somewhat arbitrary lot lines we have most folks don't really uh, realize when they go down to the waterfront park area that it might be shared by the city or the former NRA and the waterfront trust. Uh, and so um, the conversation we've had to date is about having one coherent irrigation system for the area that uh, makes sure everything is maintained well. Um, uh, but um, of course that comes with uh, a little bit more work across the waterfront trust lot line uh, because there is not an irrigation system there. And um, originally this project was only looking at the east and west lots. So um, of course that all that's been an iterative discussion about which things are included or not uh, and how far the scope of this project includes or does not include different areas. Um, but it's important to note that part of the idea here was to have a cohesive irrigation system um, that doesn't neglect one area of the park uh, and, and better serve the new areas, for instance. Thank you, Andy. And I think, um, actually, I'll let you speak to this last slide on next steps. Yeah, thank you. So um, obviously, we need to get take some um, feedback from the group here. Um, and, and, you know, we have been working as best as possible to keep the project within budget, including particularly this first phase, uh, with the hopes that funding um, that's being considered by the city council right now, and a pending grant application we have that's very timely to the state uh, the next couple of weeks, um, which is contingent upon a council vote that I think is being discussed in committee tomorrow night. Um, th those are all very timely and very important. Um, if we are to get shovels in the ground in the spring, uh, of next year. So we want to incorporate any feedback that you have and I think also mobilize uh, our local efforts to gain additional funding, uh, not just through you know the, the grant sources we have locally or the state level, but also through private uh, fundraising and donations of some of the equipment that, that are um, discrete you know, items that can be added in um, with additional funding. That's to offset some of the cost increases, of course. Um, the design team obviously is going to incorporate changes and uh, comments they're receiving from city officials here and elsewhere uh, into the 100% design documentation. The idea behind that is that that 100% package is supposed to be shovel ready so we could actually go out to bid. And as Marin indicated, and the rest of the design team has spoken to, uh, you know, briefly tonight, and we've had many thorough discussions about this in the last couple of months, um, is looking at the um, demising area areas between the phase one and phase two, for instance, and having as best as possible a clean transition for the general public, should there be a year or two in between, you know, any phase work uh, to make sure that it's as, at least as coherent as possible in the interim. 
Um, and um, permitting, uh, we're getting underway with informal discussions with the Planning Board and Conservation Commission just to uh, get a sense if there's any major areas of concern that those folks might have. And then proceeding into the, uh, the actual permitting process um, that is pretty typical of any development project uh, of whatever nature. So in this case, it would be a site plan approval from the Planning Board uh, for all the site work and a D, what we call a DOD or Downtown Overlay District special permit uh, for the new building uh, to make sure that it's reasonably compatible with the, the downtown it's fitting into. Um, and those are the major components there, obviously, because of the uh, proximity to the river, uh, the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction uh, is involved, and, and there's typically a stormwater review for that. Um, chapter 91 is a state permit, um, but that is essentially about primarily about public access. Uh, obviously, we're providing uh, public restrooms, um, as uh, do some restaurants in the area. Um, under their Chapter 91 licenses. So that's the primary focus of Chapter 91 is, is uh, I think you'll obviously be happy with the additional public access for the park side here. Um, and they might have uh, some additional questions for us, but that is generally the, the goal of Chapter 91 from the state's perspective. Um, and then again, our, our ultimate goal here is, is uh, moving all these, juggling all these pieces simultaneously, the moving questions of additional funding that might be available and phasing of the project and keeping in mind market costs and um, other tweaks we can make here uh, is to have a shovel ready set of plans this fall so we can bid over the winter and get construction going in the spring. Um, I am hopeful that we'll get good bid prices, but um, we also understand that the, the market's been kind of erratic recently and, and higher costs. So Suzaki has been helping us to try to prepare for that by breaking out pieces um, a little finer grain and allowing us to cover as much ground as possible during the bid and with additional fundraising that we might be able to, to uh, obtain in the coming months. And Sandy. So I just so folks know, Councilor Cameron did drop off. So the remaining four of us have the have an opportunity to start asking questions. So I see Councilor McCauley has his hand up first. Let's get started. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we uh, was spoken about that we were uh, moving the rest, uh, the visitor center off the way. Um, and is there a reason for that? It, it, it doesn't, it, it seems like we could move it back closer to the way um, and cut down on some of that um, uh, new earthwork, but please help me understand why we've moved it away, so far away from the uh, way. Um, yeah, and Maren, I, I, if I could speak to this briefly a little bit, then if the Sasaki team wants to elaborate, do you mind just switching to uh, the graphic showing that area? Um, and it, Council Bacali, thank you. This is a really a key area that we've been spending a lot of time on in, in recent weeks. Um, so this diagram right here is showing that comparison. And I think that primarily what Sasaki was trying to be responsive to, um, and forgive me for my uh, notations here, but um, Sasaki was trying to be responsive to the fact that uh, the council last gave guidance uh, asking for this building to be shifted further uh, to the west in order to allow views to the park space uh, to be unobstructed. And there was, of course, some debate at the time as to uh, what, what views are being protected and what's the best angle of the building and size of it and so forth. Uh, but in essence, Sasaki was responsive to, in this design work, to the council's request for the building to be shifted west. Uh, in, in looking that in for greater detail and trying to be responsive to that, what Sasaki had determined was that uh, putting the building a little too close to the way resulted in being crossing the flood zone. Uh, and so we could not do that. We shifted a little bit further uh, back to the east. Uh, and again, as, as Marin pointed out, we've been spending a lot of time looking at um, the stairways, uh, the access uh, air uh, accessible uh, connections and uh, other grading needed to reach that elevation. To your point, Councillor, the, um, and as Mary mentioned earlier, the original uh, structure location close to uh, what is uh, the new Central Wharf Way, uh, newly titled Central Wharf Way and sort of a shifting of the name of the ways. Um, that new way, uh, if it was next to that way, it would be much less grading that would be needed. Um, however, I, I still think there was uh, sort of a the generic expectation of some sort of plaza or seating and whatnot with that, that building. Um, it did require Sasaki to add more fill uh, over here in order to um, bring the, put the building in that location and keep it out of the flood zones and um, future sea level rise. Uh, there has been um, a dialogue with the, some folks from the residency committee and, and those who are asking for this project and all others that the city is undertaking going forward to try to be as resilient as possible. So um, that's included things like not only the question about solar and having this building be net zero for energy, okay. uh, but also- let, let, me, let me help you, okay? Sure. Because you, you're answering way too much. I just wanna know why we moved the building over. Uh, the, this committee did not request that it got moved west. It was kind of a compromise to move it west. 
and what I'm seeing here, right, in, in this discussion is that prior, a 1,400 square foot building was estimated at $1.2 million. And now I'm looking at a 922 square foot building at, in visitor center that's $1.3 million. And the majority of that cost increase is moving the visitor center away from the way so we can create a plaza. And sure, I understand more earthworks, et cetera, along the way. I would, on the, on the um, west side, I would say get rid of the stairs and the, uh, and the ramp and uh, create universal design throughout and use more fill to be able to do that versus the added cost of, uh, I, I'm sure it's a wash between the added fill and the granite steps. But my question was uh, why we only moved it to the middle of this rectangle. Why didn't we move it closer? It would have been over 15 feet, would have reduced the number of fill, it would have reduced the number of, uh, you know, the, the, the number of uh, square uh, footage in the, um, in this plaza that we're creating uh, and all for savings. It's a great concern and question, Councillor. And I think, Frank, quite frankly, Sasaki, uh, this is not a typical projects that, that I've seen. Um, we're trying to be responsive to multiple uh, requests and objectives simultaneously, some of which at, at times can be mutually exclusive or contradictory. So in this case, Sasaki was trying to be responsive to the last guidance from the council. Uh, however, that, uh, to your point, uh, has raised other questions and concerns about cost or grading changes that would be needed to accomplish that. Hey, okay. Andy, this is uh, Connie. Can I, can I just add something here? As, as I remember- Well, I still have the floor. I still have the floor and I'd like to continue my thoughts so if you don't Council mind. Council Preston, I, again, Mr. Council McCauley has his hand up. Council uh, Preston, if you want to put your hand up, I'll let I you speak after. Answer, sorry. Great, thanks. Okay, so I'm going to shift off that because I, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe we can eventually get an answer for why this wasn't shifted closer. Um, again, this is probably for Director Port, but I'm trying to understand um, what where the um, where the renaming of an Indigenous Peoples Plaza came from. This is the first I'm hearing of it. I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea. Um, does that open the door that will open the door to other groups that want to fundraise and fund their own subsection of this park is that um, I, I didn't think that's where we were going with this and so I'm trying to understand how the planning office could uh, offer something like this without um, any consultation to this committee. Uh, sure. Well, this this is the first time you're really seeing, I think, that uh, element or that detail incorporated in the plan. So uh, initially, the conversation stemmed from Jordy Vining in our office, who unfortunately isn't here this evening, um, has been working on a couple of initiatives, um, the um, heritage, Black Heritage signage that uh, the council had discussed uh, in recent for CPA funding recently is one of those areas. Um, there was some interest in incorporating an Indigenous people's place here uh, and with some other folks who um, would like to well, see who, that. Who are those folks? That, what I'm trying to find out is, who are those folks? I mean, I'm an elected official, and this is the first time I'm hearing of this. Sure. Uh, so initially, those inquiries or those requests came from Jody Vining and from uh, Glee Woodworth, uh, who has worked on some of the trails that we have downtown, the um, the heritage trails that we have. And so idea. let me see. Yeah, okay, so sure. let me see if I understand. So Jody Vining has input a section here without any approvals from anyone on this council. Is that that's what I'm hearing? Uh, well, it, to your point, we're here to get feedback from you on the incorporation of those elements uh, and, of course, concerning but, things. But it's in the plan. But it's actually in the plan. It's in the design. I'm, I'm looking at a plan that somebody who's That's not correct, part Council. of this yes. committee has put in, right? That's so, correct, Council. Okay, so that's where I'm going with it, right? Um, so uh, the only other comment I, I have is that I think the uh, 2024 pricing um, for phase one has, has possibly killed the whole deal. Uh, when we look at what is available for funding and available for grants um, that we're looking at and we're going to be in discussions of over the next few days to try to move this forward, um, I, 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 I almost would suggest that there's a phase 1A and a phase 1B um, going forward. 
and and my last comment um, is that um, the parking clerk, who I notice is not here, uh, had asked for uh, additional space called multi-use space um, for um, so for uh, uh, potential for um, uh, parking of um, truck, uh, uh, let's call the media trucks uh, for uh, support of anything that goes on in the park itself. And what I heard was we're proposing reinforced grass for that. Can you, can you explain to me what this reinforced um, grass is versus a multi-use kind of area? Um, the yeah, having it, you, sorry. Would you like me to speak to that or you? Uh, well, I, let me just speak briefly to the conversations I've had with Clerk Jones. Uh, we, we've had had a number of discussions about this area and other uh, parking areas. We're trying to uh, maintain uh, as many spaces as we can with the additional park space that's desired for this project. Um, and uh, as you pointed out correctly, uh, Clerk Jones was concerned about a couple of those areas. Uh, and I think the Waterfront Trust was as well. And, um, and that is the in the phase one uh, schematic that Sasaki has presented here. You'll see that they've uh, suggested that we not initially do that work, but it is essentially a uh, structural reinforcement, sometimes by plastic, sometimes by other material uh, of the grass. Uh, the intention, I think, still meets, I think, what the Waterfront Trust and Clerk Jones was looking for there. I think his primary concern, I want to speak for him, but my his primary concern, I think, was that uh, we allow for those vehicles, for those special events to be parked, uh, essentially where the, the grass or the um, expanded lawn space is now on the eastern lot. Uh, thanks, Baron, for switching to that. Um, and the idea there being that at least uh, the, those activities, when it's needed, would not displace the parking, uh, thank you, Marin, in, in the lots themselves. So his primary concern, I think, was having that area uh, in our discussions. I believe he, he was on board, and I believe the Waterfront Trust was on board with the idea of keeping that uh, aesthetically feeling like park as much of the year as possible, while also allowing the vehicles to be structurally supported uh, without the need for more asphalt or coverage, if you will. So that was what yeah. that area accomplishes. But as okay, so point, maybe it's not included. I, in, in I understand the why. I'm asking the what. So can you help me define? what this reinforced grass area is. Is it um, some sort of, um, you know, paving stone that lets grass grow up through it? Is it, um, can, can you help me understand the engineering a little bit of what this is? Sure, Marin, do you, do you and your team want to speak to that? I've seen the examples, of course, out there that uh, industry examples. So have I, I'm, to I'm trying thing. to get what we're trying to propose here. Sure, and so the reinforced turf that we're speaking about here is uh, essentially a, like a plastic grid um, that allows grass to grow through it, but provides that reinforcement needed for vehicular load. So you still have a uh, lawn that can maintain that uh, use. Okay, thank you very much, and I yield. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I did just wanna point out, um, there are two other additional areas that we've added uh, for parking. Um, separate from that reinforced turf area, which is really just meant for servicing events, which is this area in here. Uh, that'll be sort of service area for trucks uh, to pull off in the parking lot that had not been in the SD plan. And then we've also added a spot here by um, making this parking lot a right angle that had previously been rounded out and uh, didn't allow for parking. And then we've also added a spot in here um, they had the parking clerk had requested two additional spots adjacent to the visitor center for drop off. Okay, uh, just before. just to follow through the the second spot that you had um, circled out um, that my understanding from your design was that is to be used for the day to day um, supply of um, you know trucks parking there. Uh, not special events, right? That that would be, you know, the the daily deliveries that happen to the restaurant, those um, uh, retail establishments along the water, correct? Uh, so actually, this spot was added for deliveries to the restaurant. Uh, sorry, I'm not seeing. Oh, okay. Oh, got there's it. A uh, delay. I think right okay, now the truck. Yep, I got it. I understand. Lot. I understand. Uh, is, is, is that um, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor McCauley. Councilor Zeed, I'll let you go, and then Councilor Preston after Councilor Zeed. Uh, thank you. Um, just to uh, first question is um, the the slide with the ancillary work. It was a slide that showed like seven hundred thousand, and then there was another column that was like one seventy four. Um, 
I believe it was it was references like drainage work and things like that. Um, I'm just trying to understand first before I really try and comment. Um, and obviously, I'm assuming we'll, we'll have these slides at some point so we can study them more in depth. But what is the funding source pr proposed for this? Uh, and and what is the what is the what is the waterfront trust? Uh, this 175 sort of attributed to them here. What what's the idea with this in terms of funding source? Right, and that's uh, partly that's the reason why Sasaki, in, uh, in addition to the land, the irrigation design that we talked about, they've brought forward these numbers so that we could parse it out that way and have further discussions with the trust and others about additional funding where uh, some of the scope here for for benefit of this park as a whole may cross the lot line onto waterfront trust area, for instance, separate from, of course, the drainage improvements, which are a city initiated project for Market Square uh, as a separate CIP project. The waterfront trust area, I think, um, requires some further discussion with the waterfront trust, of course, um, but that is part of the reason why Sasaki has helped us by breaking that out a bit. But but this is not this is not in the proposed. So the, the proposed funding is $3 million bond, 1.25 from, from a, a trust, and then potentially a $400,000 parks grant. That's what we have. This is not part of that, correct? Correct, Mary, that's correct, right? That this is a separate, correct. yeah. <laughs> but, but even though it's separate, you can't really do the project without even phase one without doing these things, correct? Well, the area, just, Mary, correct me if I'm wrong, but the areas of the smaller areas of integration where there's required connection, say, to the central um, embayment, for instance, that walkway, that primary shared use path connection on each east and west sides uh, of the wings, that is integrated with the um, original scope of the project. But there are some portions here that are outside of that. Could those not be, um, again, not necessarily that that's preferable, but some of that could be postponed, for instance, the extension of further irrigation to waterfront trust areas, for instance, if that funding is not made available? Yeah, I'd actually like to have Steve speak to this because he's been much more involved with all of the utility work. Yeah, the, um, this is a request by DPW to improve the uh, capacity of the drainage system and reduce flooding in this part of the city. Um, the park could be constructed without it. Um, we had originally, in the original estimate we had done previously, we had not included this in the cost because this was not something we had um, planned as part of the park improvements. Uh, Steve, okay. could you speak though to the Waterfront Trust? I think that might be more. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Instead of the question. Um, again, Waterfront Trust um, is including mostly uh, the irrigation improvements that were requested for the property. Um, there also is some cost associated with electrical infrastructure that would be um, serviced in this area from the new park electric system. And okay. Steve, could you clarify how much of that is necessary for the phase one uh, portion of the project? You know, if, there, if that oh. funding is not made available by the trust or others? I don't think that any of it really is necessary for phase one. I think we could do phase one without the waterfront trust area. However, you know, doing the irrigation system later once the phase one is done, I mean, we kind of want to plan for it now or doing phase one if we are going to move forward with it. And there's also an option to have two separate irrigation systems for the right. east and west mm -hmm. lot. That would just be a different irrigation design. So I think I understand the waterfront trust column, but what about this drainage improvements one, the 655-524? Is that any part of that or all of that necessary or, or maybe maybe not necessary, but stupid not to do as part of or in addition to phase one? Yeah, so that's the question I was actually answering to begin with. Um, it would, um, to your second part of your question about whether it would make sense not to do it in phase one, and this is really the prime time to do it. If we, right now it's a relatively small pipe, it's a restriction in the drainage system. Um, we discussed it with city engineer, John Eric White, and you know, he's really, concerned with the capacity of the pipe um, to do the after the park is built would be much more expensive because you then have to replace all the park improvements at the surface. Um, whereas right now it's really just, you know, existing parking areas, so minimal uh, okay. surface improvements removed. All right, understood. And then if you go back to the other slide, that's also a table like this, but it's the, it's the with, with, without the cost engineering and then with the cost engineering that you show the balancing. Yeah, I think this is it. So when I look at this one here, um, ju just, you know, I know you, you kind of went through it, but just help me make sure I understand. So up at the top there, what, which of these lines basically is, is not, you know, is hardscape and surface finishings. That's the actual sidewalks and well, whatever we call them, walkway is the correct term. I mean, I guess uh, I'm struggling. I'm sorry to get my question out correctly, but basically is there more cost engineering that can be done here 
I, I think, you know, I guess to cut to the chase on my comments, I'm, I'm absolutely struggling with this cost relative to what it delivers, relative to the fact that it sounds like there are some parts that I suppose we could skip in terms of drainage, which has been important to this committee, but would be penny wise and pound foolish uh, to do. So I don't really see how the project comes together financially. And part of that is for discussion tomorrow. <clears throat> but, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I don't know, I'm struggling, honestly. And, I, you know, I don't know what else to say. This doesn't, I don't know what you go to residents and say, okay, we spent $4.625 million dollars plus potentially another six to 700. And essentially we grew some grass on sort of two areas towards the front of the water and did the grading. So, you know, and then budgetary wise, can we even get to agreement on spending 4.625 plus? I don't know where the other money will come from. So I don't know, maybe that doesn't require a response, but I, my, my, I guess to, the one I do wanna hear back on is which of these lines still has anything left in it that, or maybe the answer is none of them. Well, I think we could certainly look at other cost savings. Uh, we did have, we've had a couple of conversations with the city already about understanding where their priorities are. And so this reflects sort of the comments that we've heard to date, um, understanding that they do really want to build that open space along the waterfront, connect the shared use path and create those like really special moments along the, um, that shared use path with the plazas and the swing structures. Uh, and then connecting the ways to the city. Um, what we've heard is that, you know, they really don't want to look at, at this time, reducing, um, you know, sort of cutting corners in terms of material costs, but looking for ways that we can fundraise for the accessories, like things that can easily be added later. Um, but I think part of the conversation today and what you'll continue to discuss tomorrow is like, where where are the priorities and what would make, I think, as a design team, we want to make phase one really special and something that the city uh, and the community is really excited about. And so understanding what would make that, um, you know, we will make do our best to make that phase one uh, budget and, work for that. Yeah, thank you. And just to wrap up before I take up too much time, I, I just want to say that, you know, this is absolutely nothing to do really with Sasaki, to be honest. You guys are doing everything you can on your end. This is more about a core question about what is the spend that we want to do and, and essentially what can that might deliver. And it's challenging because it's changing literally since the beginning of this to the end of this in, so, in, in somewhat of a severe way. But I think this is going to come more crystal clear tomorrow when we talk in committee about the actual money and say, well, what if we only want to appropriate 2.5 million? And that's not a number based in any thought, even of my own. And then we come back to here and say, is there anything you can do for that amount of money? And so I'm not putting that out there as a number. I'm just suggesting that that could be one outcome of the discussion tomorrow, one I wish we had had earlier, but this is where we are. So I'll yield with that. Thank you. Councilor Zaid, Councilor Preston, do you want to speak now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start by um, sort of echoing what Councilor Zaid said. Like, <laughs> you know, th this is no reflection on the work that Sasaki is doing, but, you know, wow, this is big changes. Um, so I guess I'll start uh, where I was trying to interject earlier when Councillor McCauley was speaking, and I apologize. Um, so my recollection of the movement of the visitor center slash restrooms was that that was a suggestion from the Waterfront Trust. Um, they sent a letter to us, um, and we as committee discussed that, and, and frankly, at the time, uh, it seemed like a good idea to me, and I think others on the committee. So it's certainly not um, unique uh, to the conversation tonight, um, but I, I certainly at the time when we had that discussion, it, um, it, I didn't necessarily appreciate how much cost would go with the movement of the building um, further back toward the, the water and to the, what would that be? West uh, of the site, um, and you know, again, creating all that plaza around it comes with a whole bunch of costs that I think we just didn't appreciate at the time. Um, then I guess my my questions would be, you know, ultimately, how much of Phase One 
would we be looking to accomplish through donations? That, uh, you know, it, it, my impression is that that's a, a very large number. Um, and then, oh, thank you. So one, $1.5 million. So, uh, phase one is uh, 486. And then we've looked at additional um, items for phase two and three, but this number is for just phase one. All right, uh, and I guess a, a, a tabling a question to maybe Director Port as well as um, uh, Kim Turner, uh, having been on the Parks Commission. Just you know, ultimately, what I'm asking is what the likelihood is there. Um, but before I mute myself again, my other question would be, what is the timelines in terms of when the council needs to finalize a, a budget on this. I mean, this is an enormous amount to take in tonight. I know there's a, a budget and finance meeting tomorrow night to um, sort of further explore all of this, but you know, uh, <laughs> with my, uh, my appreciation for Councillor Zeed uh, to, to chair this discussion tomorrow night after taking all of this in tonight. Um, you know, are we expected to sort of drive to a decision um, at our next council meeting? Uh, you know, more, I guess what more importantly, what does Sasaki slash planning and development, what is the timeline on when you need a decision from the council in terms of what the tolerance from a budgetary perspective would be? I'll stop there. Um, there are two pieces to that, I think, um, one of which I think, and, I'll, and Sasaki could speak to the, the fact that some of those um, adjustments or um, uh, scopes are included or not included or done as adults during bidding. Um, they need some guidance on that as soon as possible, really, so that they can incorporate that into plans that may, um, if there's postponement of clarification on the on questions like this, uh, that might take a little bit more time for them, for instance, to prepare 100% plans because we have to have uh, the demising lines between phases one and two and three and so forth and transitional uh, details. Um, that being said, uh, the most timely thing I think that we have in play right now is the fact that uh, the state grant for $400,000, which uh, we believe from conversations with the grant administrator, we have a good chance of getting the funding for, uh, for this particular project. Uh, that grant is due uh, in the middle of July. And so uh, the council's vote authorizing the grant, in this case, the state grant program requires the council vote to authorize the grant application. Um, and that's not always the case. Um, but uh, that order that's in committee with that it might uh, have a slight tweak to it, um, that is needed um, prior to the application deadline, I think of the 14th. So the meeting on the 11th becomes very important for the council's passage of that order. Um, that order, my understanding from the grant administrator is that even though the order is sometimes um, and, and more typically sometimes have the full appropriation uh, from the council or from the municipality um, so that the state agencies know that when they grant $400,000, they know that the gap funding is there for the rest of the project to make it truly shovel ready. Uh, my understanding is that they are satisfied with the, uh, if the order that is in committee right now stays as it's been drafted, which is that the um, 1.25 million um, that has been allocated by the trust fund commissioners and the city council already in last year's CPA, um, that referencing that is sufficient for the grant program here um, as evidence that we've done more than our, our match that we need to do. Um, but uh, so to your point, the, um, or to your question, the uh, order that deals with the grant application is most timely. And then second to that, and I defer to Sasaki here to speak to this, but um, the input on these details becomes important for them to be able to finalize plans because they have to know what to include, what not to include. And that goes to both the plans and the written specs and bid documents. Yeah, and for that, you know, we were planning to wait until after we got through all of the permitting meetings, which are early September. Uh, and that would still allow us a couple of months to document 100% uh, uh, this year. Does that answer your question, Councilor Preston? I believe so, yeah. Okay, so I see your hands up, Council McCauley, but I would like to ask a question myself, if you don't mind. Um, so there was the comment, Marin, that you had made about pushing things from phase one to phase two. And then I was trying to see, did that line up with the, the drainage piece that you have delineated for 655,000? 
kind of looked like it was part of where I would assume that the drainage work was being done. Is that how you? How yeah, you it actually had been uh, clarified in here, but the assumption is that that culvert project is done all at once, even though it does go underneath the phase two parking area, that it would be done all at once now so that the uh, park area is not dug up in the future, but in essence, that drainage line would go completely underneath the parking area. Um, I, I defer to Steve. I know you've had some conversations, maybe with John Eric White, the city engineer, about you know phasing some sort of construction of that. But I think the assumption here was that uh, all that drainage line is put in at once, even though the parking area above ground uh, might be done at a later date. Is that right? That's correct. Um, I think we could look at that as a possibility, though, of phasing some of that drain line construction. But this part, we're planning to put it all in in one. So my question. So my question is the $655,000 that we have in there for the drainage improvements, is that part of that culvert project? That is, that is. I believe the most recent estimate we had before this, Steve, if I'm not mistaken, was about $350,000 uh, for the construction costs uh, before yep. the um, overhead. And now we're, we're at sort of a 650, right? For a total included. Yeah, overhead. the changes there are mostly around, um, again, the soils information we have now more about the knowledge of the contaminated soils to deal with and dewatering necessary for that installation. Right, and so while it's important to this project to do it before, so we don't have to dig things up later on, it is basically coming from an entirely separate capital project related to drainage and market square, not from the park project itself, but the concern was doing it first so we don't dig things up later on. Okay, so this 655 is that Colbert project and your hope is to do that at the same time we're doing phase one, so we don't do it twice and it's a separate funding source that will I'm sure talk about it another time. Do I have that correct direct report? Correct, and uh, I'll, I'll defer to the administration and Ethan Manning, who I don't think is here this evening on, um, on the timing of that piece, but uh, they're following input from uh, the city engineer and DPS on this, as well as uh, Steven Sasaki, who've been working on the design aspect of this and the cost estimating we've just received. Okay, all right. My other question is regarding the, um, the visitor center. Can we go back to the page that had some of the engineering uh, work on it regarding the the option of having the building, I think it's slide on, keep going. Not the side. Is it the one with the FEMA flood zone line? Uh, I No, I thought it was the one that had the $24,000 estimate for the cost increase. And I was trying to understand, is that part of your design oh, sorry. process or is that $24,000 part of the option of raising the building? Yeah, that's, that's the option of raising the building. It's, okay. it, it creates a, it's a wood floor with a crawl space underneath rather than just a concrete slab on grade. And okay. so there's a slight increase to do the wood floor to make it so that we could lift the building. Okay, thank you. That's what I was yeah. trying to understand. All right, um, I see the other two councilors have their hands up. So I'll defer some more questions and go back to Councilor McCauley and then Councilor Dean. I'll be brief. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, I just would like a, um, a definition. I'm trying to understand um, the definition here when we talk about utilities and electrical uh, needed for the park. Uh, we, have a, we have a passive park as we speak today that has some um, you know, uh, lighting. It's closed after dark. Um, help me understand um, the the, um, please, please help me understand this this line item. Thank you. I think it's a great question. Uh, Baron, can you go to the overall site plan? And Steve, would you mind? I don't know if you're the best person to speak to this, but speak to how that fits in, um, where that cost and, and work is primarily coming from. Yes, I would. Can you repeat the, um, I missed the question of the, where the, which cost is coming this is for the electrical work. Where is the primarily the, the work and the cost coming from for that? Because as Councilor McCauley correctly pointed out, most of this is sort of perceived as being a passive park, not a whole lot of uh, you know oh, utility yeah. loads. So, so the, the um, electrical infrastructure is, includes moving the transform and detection location of where the proposed shared use path is going to go through. Um, also, um, having to raise up some of the infrastructure again, trying to get it above um, you know future sea level rise and storm flooding. Um, and reconnecting that into the existing infrastructure for the docks. Um, we're also talking with the, um, the bulkhead project team about reconnecting to those bulkhead projects in the future. Um, of course, this electrical service, the visitor center is a new electrical service there. Um, 
Steve, am, I, am I mistaken? I believe that the electrician, the city electrician in Harbor Master, there was some discussion about in, uh, changing or uh, I don't know if it's called increasing, but changing at least the type of electrical service. And that might have had something to do with the cost as well. Or yeah, and a lot of the, um, the electrical services at the bulk had to get moved. Um, so it's not just a matter of like reconnecting to existing boxes, but then running new wires to the raised up boxes of the bulkhead. So, so this is so we're in a way, uh, and this is to direct report. We're we're crossing the streams here a little bit about the bulkhead project and uh, the park project, right? Uh, in terms of electrical. Correct. We're trying as best as possible to parse these lines in the middle, so to speak, along the property line. But you know, as you point out, some of the work, because the electrical service is coming from the land side, some of that work has to be done with the park. Otherwise, the, uh, the concern the Harbor Master, I think, has had is that if we don't maintain the continuity, then they miss a season or more uh, with electrical service that's expected on the, along the boardwalk or the water side. Okay. Has, has National Grid, I, I know these are estimates, but has National Grid been part of these discussions, uh, especially when you talk about uh, moving transformers and things like that. Uh, this could be part of their uh, ongoing regular maintenance and they can just accelerate that uh, to move it to a new spot, right? Yeah, that's a good question. We are reaching out to them. We have not gotten any input from them on the costs that we're carrying here at this point. Oh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Councilor Z, and thank you, Councilor McCulloch. Good question. Yeah, I'll also try and keep it short. Um, can you just um, phase, just a couple of objective questions. So on phase one, roughly how many square feet of new space do you get that people currently can't really use or is not current? What, what, I guess what I'm getting at is I rem I'm remembering back is we used to look at cost per square foot as sort of a way to um, understand this better early on when we didn't really have anything. I think Kate used to present like, you know, here's a park in Ohio or wherever they were and, and here's the cost per square foot. And, you know, this was the Cadillac version and this was the Toyota Camry or whatever. So I guess I'm trying to figure out what that number is for phase one. Like how much is this green, this color, the part that's colored in, in terms of square footage or acreage or whatever we could use. And then can we take the cost and figure out what the cost is per square? Just to get a sense for how, just so I can learn how far, far close we were to that thought. Again, this is probably my biggest struggle is this is not bad. I mean, certainly everybody wants more park space, but tremendous cost, I think, to, to doing this. I'm looking at a satellite photo on my other monitor of, of the park, the, the current property as it is. And then the second question, and if that can't be answered tonight, it's fine, but it, it'd be helpful. And then the second question is, can you just tell us how many spaces we, we, we will have at the end of phase one? So it doesn't look like there's much change to parking, if, if really any. So that, that pretty much stays the same if I'm reading it correctly. I think both of those might require just uh, 10 minutes of us to go back into our CAD files to make sure okay. we give you the right information. I would be appreciative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Zaid. Um, I don't see any hands up from the counselors or anybody in the panelist side. Um, I will open this up to attendees. If there are any attendees in the public that would like to comment or ask questions, please raise your hand now. I see Mayor Reardon just joined. If Mayor Reardon, you wanted to speak, I see uh, Leslie Eckel. Leslie, uh, you would like to speak? And Leslie, I don't even see a microphone for you. So you're, you look to be muted. Here, can, can you, you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you very much for letting me participate. Um, I just wanted to talk about the location of the restrooms. And um, I actually support Jim McCauley's idea of perhaps bringing the restrooms back closer to, I think it's Custom House Way, um, and uh, reducing the cost. Um, I'm not, I'm obviously on the Waterfront Trust and I, I know that we were very concerned about the views, um, but I think the present location of the restrooms has been really quite successful in that it doesn't draw your attention to the restrooms, but they're available. This is a fair, if we move them back towards Custom House Way, I think it would be fairly comparable. And um, 
also i my concern has been that it's too much in the center of that area um and and if you we moved it over towards custom house way we'd have a larger plaza and i think it would relate better to the um summer view way so bear with me on my on my aesthetics but i actually really support that idea of putting it closer the restrooms back closer to where they are right now and it has the advantage of the cost savings. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Eckholt. Is there anyone else in the attendees that would like to speak or comment right now? Seeing no hands, I'll bring it back into uh, our panelists. Are there any other questions we wanna ask Sasaki tonight? Obviously we'll be having this discussion more in detail regarding the numbers tomorrow night. So I see Councilor Z's hand. Yeah, um, thank you. I apologize for raising my hand again. Just just because we have budget tomorrow and, you know, there's crossover here. But I mean, the, the question is definitely going to there's no there's no doubt the question is going to come up about are there you know, could we have three options right for three different cost price levels, um, which Councilor McCauley suggested a, a phase one A and one B or maybe add phase zero because we're running out of numbers. But, you know, is that something that Know, can be contemplated or or basically you know and again not not to be answered tonight but i'm dovetailing this with reports comments about you know the question about the park application and and we'll get more into that tomorrow but i just want to suggest to the powers that be that that's the, going to be the question and we, we're going to have to figure out a way to answer that question um hey counselor i think that's a great question i uh, i know Marin had shown there was an earlier um sketch that she had shown that was based on a sketch I had given Sasaki, I think sometime last year when we first started to think that there was a possibility of the need for phasing. And I had asked them to break out by areas, geographic areas along the waterfront. Um, and uh, so I, the reason for that diagram being graphed the way it was and, and some of the uh, schematics that you see here from Sasaki kind of fall parallel with that is I think the working assumption at that time, and I think it holds true today, is that um, the east-west connection and those uh, east-west wings uh, were considered to be the most priority uh, park spaces to build. Uh, with the shared East Pass, the raised berms and seating areas um, and, um, and those connections that are created. Um, second to that, and, and I don't want to say necessarily second, but there was also an expectation of completing uh, two ways, uh, particularly Fire Wharf Way, of course, as a legal obligation, but also the other way um, is uh, central, essentially Central Wharf Way being relocated from here to here and then renaming uh, the two ways along uh, Market Landing Park as it exists today as Upper and Lower Railroad Ave. Um, so with that being said, uh, I, I would we certainly could, uh, and it's, this is partly an iterative discussion based on the council's uh, ability to provide funding, but um, you know, uh, but uh, we've tried to also reason what, what's possible in terms of bonding capacity for CPA. Um, but generally speaking, we could shrink you know that phase one scope further. Um, but that comes with the the pros and cons of um, additional mobilizations, um, the transitional areas, and what's left there. Um, and when, uh, if constituents are asking for something that isn't provided in phase one that they're looking for, so we've been trying to as best as possible maintain the east and west wings as well as the completion of Ferry Wharf Way, the so-called legal obligation uh, for that way to be completed completed out to Water Street and the newly um, relocated or defined way here. Uh, as well. And so those were considered to be the primary areas. It's possible to shrink the, to just east and west wings, but uh, we might have folks who are concerned about the fact that those other ways haven't been completed just yet. Um, I don't know if Sasaki wants to add anything else to those uh, options, but certainly we're, we're trying to follow as best as we can the, the guidance that you all have for available funding. And uh, certainly Sasaki will be responsive to that in uh, the phasing and the tweaking, um, uh, you know, in the, in the coming weeks, we're looking for your assistance in defining that boundary. And right now we've tried to carve it up as best we can to look at the different options. I yield, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Z. Councilor McCauley, I see your hand up. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I will be quick. Um, would it be possible, um, uh, and this I think is for the planning office because we don't have these slides, right? Is this is the schematic cost, obviously the, uh, the actual projected cost in 24 is, is, as we know, is a little higher. But would it be possible for us to um, do an east lot as phase one complete and a west lot uh, as complete? And it's more for the planning office. I think it's a numbers game, right? Uh, uh, you know, what do the numbers add up to? Again, I don't have the base level info to be able to do that myself, but um, you, you know, I, I'm looking here just on the schematics and it's, 
you know, um, um, you know, 3.7 and that could be $4 million, four and a half million dollars plus the, um, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, the drainage, right. That's needed. And, I, and the whole East wing could be done, uh, in one fell swoop, uh, along the way. And that would show some real progress. Uh, and then, uh, we would, uh, tackle the West wing at another time. But that that's a uh, that's that's a uh, a metric question, right? If we could do some arithmetic on that, uh, I'm not suggesting anything else, and I don't have any additional questions for Suzaki. I, I think they've been very thorough in their response to us. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, certainly from the office's perspective, we certainly can uh, do that in an effort to do a variation like that. Um, you know, it comes with the era of discussion of, uh, you know, explaining to the public why, you know, with funding, we're able to do one thing versus another. What's the what's the most uh, economical way of doing that in an efficient way? Um, but you're right. We could parse it out different ways. And that's one option is to do east versus west um, or east wing wing first and then west wing second. So that, those are options, too. We I think Sasaki is largely looking for guidance from us on those policy level questions of where the priorities are. That way they can uh, refine it and take it forward. And Obviously, um, you know, as project manager, we're looking to you to, to tell us what you think the council can fund and then uh, back out of that um, to the plans here and to what, what can be done. So to, just to dovetail off that one, even if it's not east and west, I think what I would like to know is what does it take to get to a, get the park uh, foundation started? Like what's it take to get the, the grading done, the drainage done, so that we just build off of a solid foundation to start with, maybe not east and west, but front to back. I'm, I'm not sure how to explain that anymore, but what, is, what gets us the foundation for the park that we can build off of it from there? So, and I know Marin was talking about irrigation systems on one side or the other. Is it a matter of you know, what's it take to get the, the infrastructure built for us to move forward? And I'm it might not be the, the perfect park in phase one, but at least we have the, the foundation there that we can work from. So it's kind of a sort of dovetailing off of Councillor McCauley's question. Uh, and no one needs to answer that tonight. I see Councillor Z, do you have your hand up again? Uh, errant hand, sorry. Sorry, okay. Um, well, first I, I will say thank you to Sasaki. Uh, we can try and start wrapping it up since no one else's hands up. Uh, you, you've done a, a really nice job getting the 75%. Uh, I probably will go with count, uh, Ms. Eckholtz and Council McCauley's comments regarding the visitor center. The relocating back to probably where we initially started is probably not a bad thing to do. I'm not sure what that would require of you all, but uh, and I think that the design of the building looks much better than what I had initially expected. So thank you for sharing that. It does look good. Um, and thank you for all the other improvements you've gotten there. I think it, you've, you've come a long way since we started at the beginning of this year and uh, we appreciate all the work you've done. And we'll have a, a good spirited discussion tomorrow night about the cost we'll be looking at. So Andy, I'm assuming you're gonna post these slides and I'm hoping you can um, send it to the council. That's correct. I will, uh, I will send out a link tomorrow. We'll post the slides. I can send a link to that. We'll also be posting the recording of the meeting. So folks who want to kind of read through the, or hear through the dialogue uh, that was discussed tonight, both from Sasaki and, and members of the committee. Um, one thing that I think for Sasaki's perspective that would be helpful here, because they have obviously um, shifted around a bit uh, in that plaza area to address the council's last um, guidance for the location of the building, is um, if we do know that there's uh, consistency in the uh, shifting, let's say, back to putting it near where, where the trailer uh, shed structures are right now or closer to the way that's being constructed. That would be helpful for them to know um, if that's the direction we're going in, if that's not going to be, say, a, a course that's going to change again, um, only because it, it has required them to make some design adjustments. And if they know they're going back to that, it certainly would help to address, I think, some of the grading issues um, that we've discussed here. But if, if that is going to circle back again, then it, it may be uh, additional okay. cost and time frame. So cool. let's let's have a vote of the four of us that are left here. How do we all feel? I mean, do we all feel we should like to move it back to sort of get the building back into the ballpark? And Councilor McCauley, I don't even need to ask because your head's going up and down. But Councilor Preston and Councilor Zed, you're on. You have a picture. So how do you both feel? Uh, this council president, uh, you know, I, I really liked the idea of moving it back in to the West, but, uh, you know, at the additional price tag, I can't justify it. So I, my vote would be to, to move it back to the original positioning. Councilor Z. Same. Okay. I think you've got four, Kate. So, 
sorry. <laughs> but all right, so I, we can take that vote. Um, is there anything else? Anyone has any other questions or Sasaki, is there anything else you want us to consider tonight? Andy Port, you as well. I uh, know. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, members of the committee. I realize this is all very difficult uh, with all the costs that you know, we typically deal with, and, and seeing in here is no exception. Um, I, again, the most important thing, I think, timeline-wise, just to, to try to keep everything moving ahead, uh, irrespective of their individual timeframes, is the order for the grant application is the most timely uh, aspect, uh, so we don't miss the opportunity for $400,000 of state funding. Um, short of that, we understand that the council uh, is going to need perhaps more time to digest the numbers and come back to us and tell us what you think is the, the funding threshold that can be achieved, at which point um, Sasaki can then do a little bit more refinement on this. But because it's iterative, having some guidance from the council on what that funding threshold might be uh, for bonding, say, it would be very helpful because it helps them to then um, circle back into these uh, breakdowns that they've got to determine uh, how, how much ground we can cover. All right. Well, we have budget and finance tomorrow night. Should be a good meeting. <laughs> All right, Councilor, do we want to? Oh, I'm assuming oh. we're ready. Uh, motion to adjourn. Thank you. All those in favor, Councilor McCauley? Yes. Councilor Preston? Yes. Councilor Zeed? Yes. Councilor Stand is a yes. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much for your time tonight. Good Thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.